Hello. So uh, this should actually be, uh, be called uh, Mythology for Game Design and Product Management. So uh, who here is a game designer? Who is a product manager? Is there any students? Great, great. I like to talk to students. So my name is uh, Simon. I've been in the mobile game industry for over 10 years. I started at Gameloft uh, as a junior game designer uh, and eventually made uh, Modern Combat Sandstorm, which went on to be the most successful for a first-person shooter on uh, mobile. And then something happened. Uh, freemium happened, and we all had to adapt. And then I uh, fully embraced the business model. Uh, and over the years, I've been developing tools uh, based on um, on the game design concept out there, uh, and I want to show that to you today. So now I'm a VP of game at Magmic. Uh, I recently was promoted. So uh, I want to talk about a tool that uh, my product manager used to better break down the competitors uh, and the game designer to communicate the game design early on. This is Nothing new, I'm not gonna break any new game design concept here. Uh, I'm just using what's already out there and using it in a very practical way. So hopefully you will find the value in that. I am highly inspired by Stone Librende, who introduced the one-page game design doc uh, concept at GDC 2009. If you <coughs> sorry, if you haven't had a chance to, uh, to watch this lecture uh, yet, you can access it on the GC Vault, it's free. Uh, last time I checked it was free. And he basically came up with that idea by looking at non-gaming document that managed to communicate a lot of information in a single page. So since most people in the team won't be reading <coughs> extensive documentation, you want to have a, a single go-to document that you can use. So for example, if a new member joined the team, you want to explain what the game is about, uh, you can use that. Um, and also if you want to convince your creative director or uh, the head of uh, product management to go with your ideas, uh, you better come prepared because they probably won't read the, the extensive documentation that uh, you wrote, at least at the early uh, pre-production stage. <coughs> So we want a document that show and explain the core mechanic uh, in a very visual way. And that's kind of what user flow does. Uh, this can be considered as a one-page game design doc. This one is for a match three game. It's used to describe the core game flow. And it's a powerful tool to communicate to the developer. And uh, in the case of the artist, uh, you will be using a UX flow. Um, but it's really, actually there is no standard format for that. Uh, if you want to compare game to each other, uh, you'll end up with different user flow. So um, you want a way to, um, to, to be able to compare uh, the game in a standard format. This will be useful for your, your dev and your artist, but not so much for the game designer. So um, it's good for the what and the how, but not so much for the why. And why is really important for game designer? Uh, that's basically the, the basis of all your decision. You want to explain why you're taking decision, why your game is acting in a specific way. Um, and you also want to understand why your competitors are doing certain things. Uh, so you can either basically do the same or iterate on it and, and uh, improve it. <clears throat> Plus, I want a tool that I can use on the fly in a meeting room with a whiteboard. But <clears throat> so I'm going to use simplistic loop, but before I talk about uh, how I'm going to do this, I want to talk about flow theory. Are you familiar with uh, flow theory? Okay. Yeah. So flow is uh, the perfect balance of skill and challenges. It's when you are the most engaged in, um, in an activity. <clears throat> yeah. So it's what developer reference as being wired in, or what a poker player will call playing the A game, what most people will refer as being in the zone. It is when the time seems to stop while you do an activity. So if you, for example, I'm a huge fan of civilization, so I can play civilization for hours the whole night without even realizing what time it is, uh, it's because I'm in a flow state. And that's where we want our player to be as game designers. Flow was proposed by Mihaly Tsitsen Mihaly. I'm sorry. I completely destroyed that name. Uh, it's widely used in different fields of psychology. Uh, it's not a concept that was developed for video games, but Genova Chan, co-founder of that game company, uh, who made Flower, Flow, Journey, uh, he wrote his master thesis on this, and he basically came up with three ideas in order to put the player in a flow of states, in a state of flow. So the player has to feel a sense of personal control over the game activity. The game must be intrinsically rewarding, and the game must offer the right amount of challenges to match with the player's skills. Mm. 
this is basically a loop. You are in control, you get reward, and there are new challenges that will make you do the action again in which you are in control. <coughs> so according to him, fun is flow. If you're in a state where you're the most engaged, you're having fun, and that's something we want our uh, player to, to be in. Uh, I kind of agree with him, but there are other theories. So for example, uh, Raf Kastner in uh, his book A Theory of Fun for Game Design came up with the, the idea that fun derives from a stimulation of our brains through learning. And all games are based on a pattern that is only fun while we are learning that pattern. If you haven't read that book, I highly recommend it. It takes an hour and a half. It's really interesting. So if you do some research on learning, you quickly find out about the laws of learnings. The laws of learning were introduced by Edward Thorndike, uh, an American psychologist, and are still used today in education. So it helps to understand how information is acquired, processed, and retained. This can be a very powerful tool for game designers. So the first law is the law of readiness. You need, you need a clear objective. So for example, let's say I want to learn Spanish. Then there is the law of exercise, which, sta which states that you have to repeat that, it, that um, uh, you have to repeat and do it a lot. So if I want to learn Spanish, I'm going to have to talk Spanish a lot, read in Spanish all the time. And then the law of effect states that for every action, there must be a reward. So as I speak more Spanish, as I read in Spanish, uh, people understand it maybe better. Uh, if, if I'm in a, in a course, I'm getting good grades. So uh, that's my reward. And that is the basis for uh, BF Skinner when he came up with his idea of operant conditioning, which is a branch of behavioral psychology. By making rats repeat action and experiment with different reward schedule or punishment schedule, he was able to induce different behaviors. And that's where the, the infamous compulsion loop comes from. So we have a clear action, you get a reward, and there's an expansion in order to make you do that action again and again. So now, we, we game designers use this to uh, engage players for a longer period of time and uh, in more intense play session. Now this is debatable. Uh, there are some people who will tell you that the, the rats were actually, uh, only 20% of the rats were actually doing uh, the actions, but that's for another, another uh, discussion. What is very interesting here is that loop is very similar to the flow loop. And actually the more research you do about behaviors, you, you find out that this is always the same loop. Uh, there are some uh, studies at the MIT about uh, habit loops, which is basically the same thing. So this is what we're going to use in our, uh, in our tool today. So let's take Candy Crush Saga as an example. This is the first game. Um, and let me explain how I'm going to use Compulsion Loop to deconstruct that game. So first, the action is to play the level. And the reward will be to complete the level. The expansion will be that there will be new levels, new game mode, new narrative, and new candies. But playing the level in itself is an action. So to play the level, you have to move the candies. You have to dis uh, the reward will be to destroy the candies. And the expansion will be that there will be new configuration that will make you want to move more candies. But then destroying candies is an indirect action. So as you destroy candies, you earn points. You fill the objectives. You, uh, there is an effect on the blocker. So in that case, the licorice cage will be destroyed. And th there might be chain reactions. So if you destroy candies, that will trigger more destruction, and so on. And the expansion will be that there will be more, uh, you will move the candies, they will fall, and there will be special candies that will spawn. So this is basically the core loop of Candy Crush. Now you can go further and actually deconstruct each of the subloop into, into subloops. <coughs> yeah. So what's great with that is. It's really easy, can be drawn uh, in a few minutes in a meeting room with other game designers to try to uh, basically explain what a game is about. And you can compare uh, all the games uh, to each other using the same format. But for this presentation, let's stick to the core loop. <clears throat> Candy Crush is a freemium game. So there are non-paying user and paying user. Of course, we want to convert the non-paying users, uh, but they're both part of the DAUs, and we we need both. So in order to keep retention high, uh, we need to please both type of players. In freemium, game designer will, uh, well, in freemium, in that loop, there will be barriers. So in order to play the level, it costs lives. There are a limited uh, number of, of time or moves. Uh, and when you complete the level, there are level uh, requirements in order to succeed or fail the level. And uh, in the original Candy Crush, when you unlock a new zone, sometimes you have to uh, get three tickets to access it. 
So what game designer will do is provide keys to overcome those barriers. Of course, you want to uh, provide keys for the paying user that will allow them to overcome those barriers faster. But for the, the non-paying user, you still have to uh, give them keys so that they will stay in your game and the retention will stay high. So in Candy Crush, for example, when you play the level, you can buy lives, you can buy special candies, uh, or you can buy tickets when you unlock a new zone. And the non-paying user can share lives or tickets with their friend. There are free life regeneration when you, uh, after a certain amount of time. And um, there's free special candies, and you get back your life uh, when you complete the level. <coughs> so yeah, it's, it's, um, it's all about monetization, social, and retention. In freemium, that's what matters. So we can take that and apply it to the whole model. Yeah, sorry, I'm using paper the old uh, school way. Yeah. <laughs> so, at MagMake, we, uh, we call this motivation loops. It's basically an aggregate of all the compulsion loop inside a, a simple model that we can use. So, uh, we can clearly show the relationship between all the game loops, and we can easily compare all the games together using that method. So you deconstruct the game into many minimalistic loops. You show the purpose of each game feature, and you can communicate your vision in a single slide. But then you can extend that to, um, to more. Uh, so if you were using some uh, game design methodologies, for example, if you're using Bartle's four-player archetypes, uh, I'm sure everyone's familiar with that. If you're not, you should Google it. It's very interesting stuff. It basically states that uh, Everyone is a mix of those types of players. So every feature in your game will appeal to some of these players' type. So again, we take our motivation loops, and we can add an icon next to each feature that will help you understand which feature addressed to who in your game. But then that's not over. You can push it further. You can use Jesse Shell uh, lenses, for example. You could use uh, Nicole Lazaro for Keys to Fun. And you can basically extend your loop and add all your, uh, your reasoning, all the why you're uh, making your game this way. Uh, and it's also very uh, useful when you're analyzing other players' game, uh, other uh, competitors' games, and you want to compare them to each other. Why is Candy Crush doing something in a certain way? Uh, I thought about the, um, uh, the compulsion loop. There's, there's a principle of a reward schedule in there. There's a variable ratio uh, reward. There is a fixed ratio. That's something you can add there. So if you do that exercise and you analyze Candy Crush, you'll understand why they're, they're giving reward in a certain way at a certain time. And then you can apply that to your game. So at MagMic, the product manager used this to analyze the competitor's games, and the game designer uh, will use it to lay out the first iteration of their early game design. It can be drawn on a whiteboard. Uh, it, you can easily iterate over and over again, and it helps validate the game design choices. But most importantly, it's quick to build, uh, it's follow a simple format, and it shows a lot of information in a single page. Do you have any questions? I know it was fast. There's usually another part to this, uh, this talk, but uh, I had to cut it. I was not sure I could make it in 20 minutes. You've got like, yeah, like five minutes. It's probably better to take questions if you've got any questions. Oh, can okay, we get the uh, You can um, have my email at the very beginning. You can send me an email. <coughs> So by the way, this is actually the first time I do this presentation uh, at an event. So uh, if you want to send me comments uh, on how to improve it, uh, that'd be appreciated. You can do that in the app, actually. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Uh, yes? Um, you, use, um, you use a variety of um, different types of tables and ways to explore game design. Yeah. Um, are there particular ones that are good for mobile games as opposed to console games? Or uh, it applies is the structure that you build, is it sort of, uh, I don't know how to describe it, more universal? 
Yeah, uh, it actually applies to any type of game. Uh, when I made uh, Modern Combat, uh, first person shooter, I used the earlier version of that. But really, any game that you're making, uh, in the end, your player will be doing action, you will be rewarding them, and you need ways to motivate them to do that action again. So if you deconstruct any game design into those three steps, uh, it, it applies to everything. Board games? What? Board games? To board games? Board game? Board game um, I never tried, but maybe, yeah. Should try it. Yes? Oh, there's a question right at the back. Uh, um, hi, very good, um, very good talk. Um, could you possibly expand on the one-page doc design document? Um, it's quite an interesting um, concept, yeah. um, and you know, unfortunately, I have much time to go into it. I know it's a GDC talk, mm -hmm. but could you explain in your own words how you interpret the one-page design document and how you use it in any games you've created? Yeah. So uh, basically, I found that uh, my take on game design document, uh, the game design bible, or our word, that time is over. No one reads a huge documentation, uh, and um, actually. Not much people in the team actually read. Uh, the developer will read certain specific parts of the game design that address to what they're building, but not, not much people will read the, the whole thing. So it's really hard to convey what the, the vision of the game is, uh, especially at the early stage when you're in pre-production and you want uh, everyone in the team to be on the same page to understand what you're doing. So that's how we use it to build our game, but also one of the first steps in pre-production, for uh, especially for product manager, is to analyze all the competitors, uh, to, to see what uh, the, the segment you're uh, addressing is is about what is the, the, the winning form life, I can say. Uh, there is no such thing, but there is some, like, there is no recipe for success, but there are some, certainly ingredients. And by doing that exercise, you can basically, uh, in a meeting room with whiteboards, you can draw the, the, the motivation loops of all your top competitors. And there was some stuff that, that will just like stand out. You, you will see that, okay, this is something that everyone is doing. Why are they doing it? And then you take the time to analyze, uh, and you get your answers.